accesses. Number one, look for anything where, um, where a scope is not explicitly supplied because that's a, that's a bad coding practice in general. Uh, but really look for mismatches between read and write. So if somebody sets a variable as um, uh, session dot something, or if they, sets, if, they, if they set the variable with a scope, but then they read it later without a scope, that's kind of a warning sign to watch out for because uh, there, may be, there may be mismatches in what actually gets read later uh, because of the search order. Here's some contrived code. You have a if function that says, if this important variable is defined, then do this stuff. Um, otherwise, throw up an error message. And the idea is that maybe something else in the application may have set that variable if you were authorized to do that or, or if, the, the, if, if, uh, if you went through a certain workflow. Um, but because that variable is unscoped, you can just put into your query string, important var equals anything you want. And when that comes to be evaluated, if you go back to that search order, the first thing it's going to do is it's going to look through in that order. And once it gets to number three, it's going to say, OK, if the variable's in the URL, it does exist, uh, is defined, we'll evaluate it true. And then it will do important stuff, whatever happens to be in that, in that function. Um, so you're essentially bypassing a check here because of the fact that uh, the variable is unscoped. Um, if, it, if they had used variables.importVar, for example, there would be no way that it would possibly get confused with something that came in uh, on the query string. Um, kind of another example of the same thing. Um, I probably won't go into too much detail here, but uh, just the idea is, again, you have them setting a variable called client.admin up here. So it's being set into the client scope, but later when it checks to see if you're, you are the admin and it should let you do something privileged, it's just checking admin as opposed to client.admin. So again, client is sixth on the list. So uh, if there's a variable called client in any of the other scopes, that will, that will um, preclude uh, the real client.admin from being checked. So again, just look for mismatched scopes. Undefined variables are another uh, interesting thing to look at. Um, there's a function called cfparam, uh, which which provides a default value for a variable that hasn't already been set. And some people kind of use this incorrectly. So here we say, uh, define a variable called page num. If it's not already defined, uh, set it to one. And then this page would just say, now showing page one. Um, and developers will do that all the time, not realizing that um, that's completely injectable. It looks like there's no way to get any other value into this variable called page num. But again, you can just override that in the get or the post or the cookie or uh, uh, anywhere uh, that's in that search order. Um, and now you can, you know, now you can create a cross-site scripting uh, injection at that point, even though it looks from the code that you can't. Uh, if you're not aware of the search order, then you don't know that's going to happen. Environment variables, um, I talked about the CGI scope and how in Cold Fusion you can set a lot of variables that you wouldn't normally be able to set. Uh, this example, it looks at the host header and HTTP host will contain example.com. But if you provide a request like that where you provide a real host header and something and just uh, a header that happens to be named HTTP host, um, that will override what the real host header is. Additionally, other CGI member variables that usually in other platforms you can't touch as, a, as an end user. You can't touch remote user or path info server software. I mean, why would the user ever be able to override those? On Cold Fusion, you can just by providing an HTTP header called server software. And if you do that, then, you know, then the user controls that value. Now, the exploitability of these, you know, probably not, not that high because it involves you know, modifying the headers of the request. but Again, if you're looking at the code, you should have to be aware that, that these things can happen, and that not just to consider those variables to be trusted by default. I'm almost done. I got one more slide. Uh, the last one, persistent issues. So we talked about the client scope, and that sometimes developers use the client scope of variables to persist uh, data across uh, multiple visits to a site. Well, how, do, how does that actually work behind the scenes? Um, well, first, they have to turn it on via the client management attribute. Uh, but then what happens by default is if they source, store something in the client scope, uh, the browser will drop a cookie. Um, the easiest, easiest sort of way to do it. Um, they can also configure it to use a server-side database to store that value, which would be more secure to do that. But by default, it's going to just set a cookie uh, 
uh, named whatever they named the variable. Um, and it's all in the, in, the, in the clear. There's no encryption. There's no integrity checking, and check, the integrity checking or max. Um, it's just there in the clear. And most developers will not realize when they you know, just set a variable in the client scope that it's dropping a cookie. So there are um, uh, possible attack points there through cookie tampering. Um, if the developer happens to put something sensitive there or something that they don't assume that the user can modify. Um, so if you're doing a pen test, you'll obviously see the cookies flying around. It'll be pretty obvious. But if you're looking just at code, be aware that anything in the client scope is probably going into a cookie, and, and it can be poisoned or, or tampered with. Um, so that's the end of this. We were going to go through a little bit more about you know, what Cold Fusion looks like, when, looks like when it's compiled down to Java and kind of reverse engineering the, those classes and the, the proprietary file format. Uh, unfortunately, this is only a 35-minute slot, so if you want to see the rest of that stuff, uh, wait for Black Hat, and we'll have an additional 20, 25 minutes there. Um, additional resources, uh, we have a blog at Veracode, and then uh, for any questions, my email and Twitter information is up there, as well as uh, I'll be around the conference uh, the rest of uh, today and tomorrow. So, uh, out of time, so thank you guys.